The biggest idea in AI in the last years was the transformer model. And I am sure you all have used a transformer model before, chat GPT. But transformers cannot only generate, classify, complete or translate text. They can also work with images or generate speech. La idea más grande en IA en los últimos años fue el modelo transformador. I will show you how a transformer works and how it is constructed. Why are transformers such a big deal? We were able to process sequential data like text with neural networks for centuries, but better and faster GPUs and more memory were not enough to make the leap forward. In ancient times, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, were the go-to solution for natural language processing problems. But RNNs have a big issue. You would feed an input token by token into an RNN. The RNN would then classify the text, translate the text, generate audio, etc. This sequential nature makes them really slow. And this is true for using and training the RNN. RNNs have other problems as well, especially when it comes to remembering the input and training them. But all of this is a topic for another video. And then this paper came along. Attention is all you need, showing that you can solve translation problems with a parallel layer by layer architecture called a transformer. There was no need anymore to feed the input word by word. It was ingested all in parallel. And the first word of the output was instantly there after all layers were calculated. To generate a translation, you would only need to run the transformer for the length of the output and you are done. And this makes a huge difference, not only during running the transformer, but also during training. With this, we were finally able to use our GPU, which are built to run stuff in parallel to their full potential and were able to train models with sizes never seen before. What are transformers? Transformers come in different shapes and forms. They can be classified in encoder, decoder and encoder, decoder models. On a high level, you can say that the primary use case for encoders is to understand input. Decoders generate new output and encoder decoder models combine both capabilities. More technically, an encoder takes the input and transforms it into a higher dimension. This means a more abstract representation of the context, which is then outputted in the form of a vectorized embedding. Typical use cases for an encoder are generating those embeddings, classify text into categories, for instance, into negative or positive, name entity recognition or NER, which means to find names, locations, items, etc. in a text and mark them, information extraction, a special case of NER where you can also tell the model what you're looking for. A decoder, on the other hand, generates output from an embedding of some sort. The embedding here can be any kind of vectorized representation of the input data. This can be used for text generation like ChatGPT, machine translation, image captioning and speech to text. Although we are thinking a lot about textual input, image captioning is a task for which a transformer needs to take an image as an input or maybe an image and a text prompt. The encoder decoder models are a combination of both. The encoder understands the text and generates an embedding for the decoder to ingest and to generate new text from. This is also used for machine translation, but can also be used for summarization, question answering, text to speech or speech to text. These are just examples of use cases. Not only are there a lot more use cases, but the borders between all of these capabilities are very blurry which means some decoder models like GPT-4 are well capable to summarize text as well and in the same time tell us if the text was positive or negative. Now, let's zoom in a little bit and have a look at what an encoder looks like. An encoder consists of multiple so-called multi-head attention layers stacked upon each other. These multi-head attention layers are trained to understand the input text, which is handed in all at once to the first layer. Each attention head in a multi-head attention layer looks for different things in the input. We can imagine that there might be one attention head that searches for subject-verb combinations, one that is looking for words indicating the tense, and maybe one that looks for negations. 
All of the independent outputs of the attention heads are then combined and made sense of by a normal feed forward network. This output is then handed to the next multi-head attention layer. The idea here is that as the data progresses from layer to layer, each multi-head attention layer pays attention to more general concepts in the input data, like language, topics, style of writing, etc. These are again simplified examples to give you an intuition of what's happening. But to be honest, I'm not sure that we really know what each layer does in a model like GPT-4. If you want to know how the attention heads work in detail, I link a video here and in the description below. After the data has passed the last multi-head attention layer, we have the embedding. Depending on what the model is supposed to do, more layers might follow to help the model achieve its designated task. How do we feed input to the first multi-head attention layer? Neural networks cannot directly work with lists of words. We need to transform them. The first step is to transform them into tokens. This process is called tokenization and it turns our words into a list of numbers. For example, OpenAI uses a method called tick token and you can try it online. As you can see, the input please like and subscribe is turned into the numbers 5618, 1093, 3023, 18447. Each transform model has a so-called context size. This is the maximum number of tokens we can hand over to the model. If the input is shorter, a special padding token is added to the end. The biggest GPT-4 model has a context size of roughly 128,000 tokens. Our example model gets an input size of 10. To ensure our input length is 10, we need to add padding to our input by appending padding tokens to it. I choose 0 to be a padding token, but technically it could be any other number. Token numbers can get very big depending on the vocabulary size. And if you are familiar with neural networks and backpropagation, you know that data with a very high variance is hard to train on. So big numbers are a problem. To fix that, we use vector embeddings. Vector embeddings are multidimensional vector representations of our tokens. And the interesting part is that words that are very similar in meaning are close. And words that are completely unrelated are far away from each other if you imagine these vectors being points in space. So we are not just encoding them to random vectors, we are also injecting some semantics into them. Naively we could think that we just hand this matrix to the first multi-attention layer and let the encoder do its magic. But there is another problem. Unlike RNNs, transformers get all of these vectorized input words at once. And because of that, we are losing all of the sequential information of the data. So to the model, the sentence Tom eats the tuna steak is identical to the tuna eats Tom steak. To save Tom and help the model understand the sentence better, we need something called positional encoding. Positional encoding means we are attaching positional information to each vector embedding in the input. But just numbering the tokens is not a good idea, because for very big context sizes, we get very big numbers at the end of the context. And we don't like big numbers. So another idea is to simply add a value going from 0 to 1 to each embedding vector. But how do we add it? Do we add 0.33 to all the components of our vector embedding? Or do we add a new dimension? Actually, both might work. I don't know. When you consume a lot of other videos and articles, a lot of time it is said that this way of encoding the position is not working because we have different input length and 0.5 encodes a different position in a three-word sentence than it would in a hundred-word sentence. At first sight, that sounds very logical, but actually we are padding our input to always be the full context size. So there is no difference in input length after padding. So I'm not actually sure if this is really an argument against a linear positional encoding going from zero to one, but please let me know if I'm missing something here in the comments. But what actually is happening is much smarter. In the paper, for attention is all you need, the following encoding is proposed. Instead of having a number to add to our vector embeddings, they propose adding a positional vector to our vector encodings. And this vector is calculating using a rather daunting looking formula using sine and cosine functions. I don't want to go too deep into the math here, but intuitively what's happening is that for each position in the context, a sine cosine wave is calculated. With every next token position, the frequency of this wave increases. So for the first token, we have a rather low frequency wave and for the last token, the frequency is very high. Values from these waves are then encoded into vectors with the same size as our input vector embeddings and simply added to them. 
Now, each vector embedding contains a signal which indicates its position in the context window. And this is now handed to the first multi-head attention layer. And the multi-head attention layer hands all the input to each of its attention heads. This progresses through all layers and at the end we get some distilled text understanding from the encoder. This is the basic way an encoder works. But as always, things are not as easy as we would like them to be. When training a deep neural network, there is one thing that never behaves like we want it to. The gradients. The deeper the model gets, the higher the probability for vanishing or exploding gradients. And that's not good. In one case, the model stops learning, and in the other case, the model just spirals out of control. We need to add two mechanisms to help the model learn more evenly. But first, let's recap what we already have. Given our input, we generate tokens and our input embeddings. Then, we add the positional encoding and feed this to all attention heads. Each attention head produces a separate output, which we concatenate and feed into a feedforward layer to make sense of things. This gives us the output which we can either evaluate or feed into the next attention head layer. The attention heads and the feedforward layer form the multi-head attention layer. The first normalization mechanism that we need is layer norm. Layer norm smooths the values handed to every layer, which helps with exploding gradients. We add a layer norm layer before each attention head layer and in front of the feedforward layers. In attention is all you need, layer norm was added after each layer, but nowadays pre-layer norm is the norm. The layer norm layers are part of the multi-head attention layers as well, so they will be also repeated if we stack multiple multi-head attention layers. The next normalization mechanism is adding residual connections. Residual connection means we are adding the input of one layer to the output of that layer. So the values that go into the layer norm and then into the attention heads will also be added to each attention head output as well. And this input to the next layer norm and then to the feed forward network will also be added to the output of the feed forward network. This helps the model to learn better during training because if we encounter vanishing gradients, the model still has the original input to learn from. And that is the finished multi-head attention layer. This can be stacked a couple of times, giving us an encoder. Now that we know how an encoder is constructed and how we need to pass our input to it, let's have a look at the decoder. The good news is that encoder and decoders are almost identical. There's just one slight difference. And to understand the difference, let's recap the difference between an encoder and a decoder. An encoder is used to ingest all of the input and to make sense of it. It needs to pay attention to all the tokens at once, so the attention heads search for patterns in all directions. An attention head looking for a verb for a given subject looks in tokens before it or after it. Everything is fair game. A decoder, on the other hand, is a generator. It takes a couple of tokens and should predict which token comes next. For that task, the attention heads need to be trained a little bit differently. They should be only looking at past tokens to make predictions. So the attention head looking for subject-verb combinations must only look for a subject to a verb in previous tokens. And this mechanism is called masked attention. It's called masked attention because all the future tokens are masked and not accessible. To turn the encoder into a decoder, all we have to do is to swap out the attention heads for masked attention heads, making the multi-head attention layer a masked multi-head attention layer. All the rest stays the same. We still need tokenization and vector embeddings for our input and still need to add positional encoding. All the normalization that we discussed before still applies, but is all hidden inside the masked multi-head attention layer block here. To turn the output into a probability for the next word, a linear layer followed by a softmax is used. Running this gives us the next token. After we have one token predicted, to predict the next token we attach the newly predicted token to our former input and let it all run again and again. And again, and again. At some point the decoder will spit out a special end token and the generation stops. Feeding a model its own output is called autoregression by the way. A decoder is therefore a so-called autoregressive model. Last but not least, encoder decoder transformer. The encoder decoder transformer combines an encoder stack and a decoder stack. The input consists of the input to the encoder, for example an English sentence, and the already generated output of the decoder. If we have nothing generated yet, we just start with a padding or a special start token. How is the encoder connected to the decoder? 
After each masked multi-head attention layer of the decoder stack, a multi-head attention layer is added. The output of the encoder stack is then handed into each multi-head attention layer of the decoder stack. Let's see how it runs. The encoder processes its input and generates an embedding. This embedding is then injected into the multi-head attention layers in the decoder stack. Then the decoder stack processes its input to predict the next token. When we think of a machine translation model, the intuition here is that the encoder's job is to understand the English sentence. It then provides the gist of it to the multi-head attention layers of the decoder stack. Now the decoder stack is able to predict the next token of the translation. And we can run this again multiple times to translate this sentence. Please consider subscribing and liking the video if you found it helpful. And if you want to deepen your understanding even more, this video here will teach you the ins and outs of the attention mechanism in transform models. Have a lot of fun, coders!